Well, I'm very glad that you're here for our final Hewerman lecture of the 2016-2017 season. Uh, for those of you that might not know, the Hewerman Lectures within the Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources provide a focus on uh, conversations related to sustaining enough food, natural resources, and renewable energy for the world's people, and on securing the sustainability of rural communities across Nebraska, across the Great Plains, and across the U.S., where the vital work of producing much of our food, fuel, and renewable um, energy occurs. The Hewerman Lecture Series is made possible by a very generous gift from Keith and Norma Hewerman of Phillips, and Keith and his son Scott are here. If you wouldn't mind raising your hand there, Keith. It's right here, right in front. Thank you. A little bit on the housekeeping side of, the, uh, of things. This lecture is being streamed online, real time. For those watching online, feel free to ask questions via our online web form or simply tweet using the hashtag HLSeries, number sign, HLSeries, and we'll get your questions at the end of uh, our speaker's time. The format for this evening is that our speaker will give about 40 to 45 minutes of presentation and then we'll have 15 to 20 minutes to uh, have questions and answers. There are microphones located in the center aisle and for those who, of you who would prefer to, uh, in the room, who would prefer to be seated, we have a floating microphone and just raise your hand and Jesse will, will get that to you. So it's my uh, esteemed uh, pleasure to introduce our, our guest today, uh, who I had the chance to meet yesterday during the, the Water for Food conference, um, A.G. Kawamura. Uh, A.J. A.G., I knew I was going to do that A.J. thing, I always do, sorry, A.J. G. <laughs> <laughs> wow, a long week. Um, our Hewerman lecture and closing, he's actually the closing plenary speaker for the 2017 Water for Food Global Conference that has been running for the last three days. So we're just uh, toward the end of that. AG is the former Secretary of Agriculture for California, a position he held from 2003 to 2010. He is also a third generation producer and grower and shipper from Orange County, California, with more than 30 years expertise and experience in agriculture and policy, uh, natural resource policy. He is the founding co-chair of an organization called Solutions from the Land, a national not-for-profit that is focused on working with farm, ranch, and forest land managers helping to build sustainable collaborations that actually will move us forward in a sustainable way in the 21st century. AG is actively involved in education, hunger and nutrition policy areas. He serves on several boards and committees including the Agriculture Advisory Committee for the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, the AGREE capital A-G-R-E-E -E, initiative, very clever, the Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources, a policy arm of the National Academy of Sciences Natural Resource Council, and the American Farmland Trust Board and the Western Growers Association. As a progressive urban farmer, Kawamura A.G. has spent a lifetime uh, and has a lifetime experience working across the dynamic gradient from rural to suburban and exurban and, and urban areas and, uh, of Southern California and, and actually around uh, the Western US and the world. He's working hard to end hunger by engaging with local food banks to create collaborative agricultural and natural resource projects. Would you please extend a very warm Nebraska welcome to A.G. Kawamura. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, 
I wanted to put this quote up there. I've got two of my heroes would be Henry Wallace and Norman Borlaug, and both of them, uh, you could argue, had the kind of vision, the kind of understanding of what was going on globally, so much so that it drove their lives and everything they did. And as they looked at a world in turmoil, as they looked at a world that had tremendous challenges ahead of it, they did so with uh, a glass half full. They recognized that they had an opportunity to find solutions. Uh, they recognized they had ability to utilize uh, the knowledge of the day, to put it into play, and to make a difference. And more importantly, they understood that there was tremendous urgency in, in everything that they were doing and that the clock was ticking. And so, it's a kind of amazing that uh, uh, my good friend Bart Ruth up here uh, is responsible for me uh, standing here in front of you in many ways. We've been working together with our, our project called Solutions from the Land, which is a time-sensitive uh, endeavor looking at the way that we might change the picture for those of us who are farmers, those of us who are ranchers or foresters, and those of us who recognize that we need help that we want help, that we need assistance in getting into this century and uh, cre uh, creating and achieving the kind of transformation on the farm, on the ranch, in the forest that might make this uh, planet a little bit different. And as we do that, uh, it was last September, I believe, or early the middle of last year when I had a chance to be asked to be standing here in front of you. Isn't it amazing the difference a year will make? or nine or nine months even, because was, at that point we were headed towards uh, a national election, uh, and we were headed also into our fifth year of drought, of significant drought out in California. And many of us were living a life of dread. Uh, you can take your pick of which side was dread and which side was excitement. Uh, and after that, uh, it's amazing as we stand here in uh, April, that uh, after that election and after this year of enormous rain, some of us still hold a lot of dread. You can take your pick on which one you're dreading. Uh, but the dread is that uh, we were praying for a lot of results. We were praying for changes. We were praying for rain. Uh, and currently we have gotten the answer to some of those prayers, so much so that we're almost praying for it to stop. Uh, I, I'm a strawberry grower, and as we started to go through January, February, and our fields would not dry out, uh, I can tell you that we've thrown a tremendous amount of our strawberry fruit away. Um, because of when it doesn't dry out, we have a tremendous amount of botrytis, of rot, that gets into the uh, strawberries. So I apologize if you've been dry, uh, buying strawberries from California and they show up with a few rotten ones in the basket because guess what? Um, when you uh, uh, leave them out in the wet for a long time, it's just one of those natural things that happen. And you try and stop the rot with the different tools that might be available. And whether you're a conventional grower or you're organic grower, you start to see that it's not an easy uh, situation when Mother Nature doesn't want to necessarily uh, participate with uh, your desired result. But as we're looking at this kind of a quote up here, and as we're looking at uh, all the different things that are facing the producer, facing uh, the consumer, and then more importantly, facing a planet that has uh, just the widest range. And this conference this last couple of days was as good an example to show how wide a range of situations uh, of, of um, challenges, but opportunities that we have, but in such wide ranging uh, uh, stages of development, whether you don't even have a tractor, whether you don't even have uh, irrigation, or whether you're trying to adjust to new kinds of systems, all of these um, give us almost a crisis of thinking. Uh, our, our crisis of thinking is as simple as this. The, our societies are kind of uh, forgetting about agriculture. I'll talk about that in a bit. Our, our understanding of where our food supply comes from uh, and how, whether that should be a right or that should be a privilege. That's a, a kind of a topic I'd like to cover. Uh, and I'm going to give you kind of a quick background of maybe a, a homespun story of what I was experiencing in our operations in Southern California this last couple years. 
um, and then move on to more of a, a, a picture of uh, what's happening with different countries and some examples of how uh, their thinking under crisis changed how they operated their countries. And then I'm gonna, I'd like to talk about maybe a little bit different framework of how we look at uh, resilience in the face of natural made crises or, or man-made crises and kind of get to a point where we can uh, have a dialogue about this world ahead of us and, and what's uh, out there, more importantly on where we might see ourselves going uh, if we could just turn our, our vision a little bit. And I, I know many of you have heard, obviously, that great quote about whiskey is for drinking, and we're going to hope that uh, we're going to have a chance to drink a little whiskey after the event so that we can get our, uh, ourselves a little more aligned with uh, not, our, uh, not our chance to fight, but our chance to uh, actually collaborate. Um, in fact, my favorite Mark Twain quote is not that quote. My favorite Mark Twain quote uh, goes like this. Um, you can't trust your judgment if your imagination is out of focus. And trusting your judgment at a time when you can't see into the future or you're refusing to acknowledge what the future has to uh, offer is, is part of our challenge today. In fact, uh, if you look, obviously, if you put on a different set of glasses, your vision changes. And so I'm going to ask everybody to try and be willing to, as we talk about the different things today, is put on that different lens, if you will. And that different lens, I hope, will give us a different vision uh, of where uh, we might go, and more importantly, on how quickly we might be able to get there. So the first is a tale of three watersheds. I farm in uh, Southern California, near Disneyland, if you're wondering where the, whereabouts in Southern California. And I farm in three different watersheds. And as we were going into year uh, two, coming into year three of the drought, I was in this one little watershed that drains, it's in the San Juan Capistrano, it drains out into the San Juan, into the Pacific Pacific Ocean, of course, and it's a small place. I should have been farming around 200 acres in there, uh, and yet uh, we had been already pushed back a little bit because of challenges where my landlord, I don't own the land, but they have citrus and avocados and, uh, and permanent nursery crops right above us, but we were farming on some great land, and uh, we were about three weeks uh, out from our harvest of a crop of green beans. It was uh, late springtime, and the well went dry. And we're going, uh-oh, and we don't have any plan B. There's no secondary source except for borrowing a little uh, three-quarter inch line from the nursery above us. And we bled that in there, and we tried to make the, finish the crop, and we still lost about 20-something percent. Uh, and that was going into year three of the drought. By the next year, our landlord basically said, hey, you know what, I gotta protect these trees. Uh, the well's dry uh, down where you are. Uh, we want you to stop. Uh, and that inelasticity, if you will, of having permanent tree crops and elasticity of having uh, uh, um, uh, row crops like I grow, I was the easy odd, odd man out. And so if that had been our only operation, we would have been done. Last year, we pulled all of our, uh, last year heading into the drought, we pull, pulled all of our filters and our main line and took everything out of that ranch and just walked away because we just were terrified that in year five and six, we just were never going to get back there again. Going north, just about 30 miles, I farm in another watershed that happens to be about a mile's uh, distance, mile and a half distance from where the, uh, uh, from the Pacific Ocean, actually. And we have a well water at, uh, at that site. And we started to see enough salts build up in year three. And as we got into year four, we started to see a lot of salt water intrusion starting to affect the quality of that well. So much so that one of the wells that was closer to the ocean, we had to shut it down. It was just too salty, and our pH and our salt was off a chart. And we started to see the phyto effects on our plants where there's yellowing and all kinds of things. And we were doing what we could to buffer and to try and adjust uh, and try and move. We use all drip irrigation, so we were able to at least move some of the water away from the roots, the saltiness away from the roots. And we were getting crops, but we were getting damage. And we were about ready to basically walk away. We realized because of the technology of understanding what kind of geology we had and the fact that we knew there was another aquifer below us that had some pretty good water, um, quality water. In fact, it was an ancient redwood forest uh, that used to be in the, in the LA basin, if you can imagine, because there's water down there that's rust colored. Um, we were able to go ahead and drill a well. Of course, we started drilling on December 8th or so. Uh, and the minute we started drilling, it started raining. So, you know, that's, if we didn't drill, it wouldn't have rained. So thank you for the, for the end of the drought, I suppose. That's how that goes. 
but the truth is there is that we were in a situation where uh, we were about ready also to stop farming if we didn't have a plan B in place. And the plan B was, okay, we know we have another aquifer. Let's go see if we can get some more water. Um, and the water was plentiful at, it wasn't dry up at the 200 foot level, it was just too salty. The saltwater intrusion was happening. So that's the second watershed. I farm in another, another watershed, which is in the Santa Ana River District. The Santa Ana River uh, in, in Southern California is one of the most highly engineered watersheds anywhere on the planet. Uh, we have a lot of very sharp, smart, forward-thinking engineering companies, water companies that realized that the populations of Southern California uh, were urbanizing at such a rate, but there was not enough water. We import water from the Colorado. We import water from the San Joaquin uh, uh, state system. And then there's a, uh, there is an aquifer, and then there's, of course, a tremendous amount of potential. And developed uh, 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 capacity for reclaimed water. And, and for the last 30 years, uh, there's been a, a very aggressive reclaimed water system uh, that was designed and put into place in our area. We started using reclaimed water over 25 years ago. And while there were little blips and problems with the, the monitoring of that water quality to make sure it didn't spike too high with salts, it's been one of the most stable, best water supplies you can ever imagine, and it's pressurized as well. And so in our area, it, during this drought, during year three, dear, during year four, going into year five, we had no fear that we wouldn't have access to not only reclaim water, but that also meant we had access to potable water, enormously more expensive, but there also was some groundwater in the area, but we had plan A, plan B, some plan C, some ways to go, and we weren't as concerned, even though we were headed towards this, this really, really uh, horrible thought of, of a fifth year uh, of drought in California that would have started to have the wheels come off. And I fast forward then, so that's my little example of here I'm a farmer, pretty aggressive farmer, pretty uh, high-tech area, pretty modern part of the state, uh, pretty well briefed on what's happening. I was about to be shut down if I hadn't had at least one avenue to go. We would have been out of business and shut down in this drought if we had gotten into year five and we didn't have a few options. So now let's take a look at a couple countries. The Netherlands is a, an amazing country. Uh, it was founded in, uh, it became a country in 1648. So it's had a couple centuries to learn uh, some hard earned lessons. And over the course of time, uh, the Netherlands, I, I'm sure many of you had a, had a chance to visit there. They are remarkable people, very resilient, very smart, very forward thinking, but they come out of a long line of, 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 of a civilization that suffered uh, significantly for decades, for centuries, uh, almost for, uh, uh, for half a century. Well, not quite, because it was in the year 1950s, in the 50s was the last time the North Sea surged and put their country underwater for the umpteenth time. You know the windmills, you know, remember those of us who were born in the 50s, the little Dutch kids putting their fingers in the, in the levees and trying to avoid uh, the catastrophic flooding, but they had a catastrophic flood that took out thousands of people um, for the umpteenth time because their 40% of their country is below sea level. And it was in the 1950s then that they built, uh, said they said, no more, we're not gonna suffer this anymore. And they built with the technology of the day, this is 1950s into the 60s, an enormous seawall. Uh, and they built it uh, to basically say that they were not gonna, they were gonna take a charge of their own destiny. I remember vividly when I was secretary in California in 2006, we were about ready to be inundated with catastrophic flooding because we had a tremendous snowpack in 2006. We had a predicted surge of uh, uh, atmospheric river storms coming out of the Pacific, the Pineapple Express. And we knew at that time that the reservoirs, it was April, the reservoirs were full and it, we knew that that next predicted storm, which was predicted, was, would have put us over the top. So we were releasing water like mad. We were uh, just basically, again, praying uh, because there was nothing we could do but, but just deal with it. And by grace of God, that storm moved north. And it didn't, have, didn't hit us. And we survived that. Around that time, a team of uh, Dutch engineers showed up in our offices, showed up at the governor's offices, and they took a look. They had just been down to uh, visit uh, New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina, which had just happened, and they came up to our offices, and they were telling us, I remember we were sitting around a room, and they said, 
well, you know, uh, you guys are more vulnerable actually than you, the folks in New Orleans with your levees and deltas. You're, you're not very set up very well. Um, but in our, our country, and I always remember this, our, our country, the engineer was saying, we built these seawalls to withstand a, a one in 10,000 year storm surge. And I remember raising my hand, I'm in the room because we, we heard it, one in 10,000 years. And I go, well, I raised my hands, I said, I, you mean one in a thousand, I think you got the zero wrong, it must be something in the translation or something. And the guy looks at me and he says, no, we've got one in a thousand year protection for places we don't care about. <laughs> but we've built our protection for one in, one in 10,000 year storm one storm in 10,000 years that this would happen. And, if the, and, and he adds, if the sea levels are rising, we don't think that's going to be adequate, so we're already starting to re-engineer again. There was silence in that room, uh, the Californians in that room, and we all looked at ourselves because the best protection we have in, Southern Calif in Northern California, there's about one in 300 year storm protection on those levees and any kind of a seawall concept or anything else, there's nothing there. And so there comes a point where you have to ask, if you don't know any better, you can say you're ignorant. You can say that we don't understand our challenges or these aren't threats or, or who knows what will happen. But when you do know better and you understand that there are uh, threats that you you're facing and you don't do something about it, that's where you're approaching a, a kind of negligence that's alarming. And this takes place around the, the world that we're looking at deferred maintenance and other things that are taking place. The third country, we had three watersheds and I want to talk about three countries, uh, the Netherlands, uh, the other two is Australia. Um, and Australia, just a simple observation there, by year eight in their epic 10, 12 year drought, by year eight, 50% of their agricultural activity in their whole country was shut down. Towns were closing. They were the, uh, one of the top rice producers in their world. I think 4% of the world rice production was coming out of Australia. It went down to zero. Wheat went down to 1% of production. Uh, and this was by year seven and eight is when they started to see the wheels come off really in a way that uh, no one could have foreseen. But now in retrospect, you recognize that oh, there was no plan B. There was no plan C. There was just, oh, this is the system we have. And so uh, Australia, however, was, was founded as a country in 1901. So they've had a little less time to kind of think about their, their outcome of their, uh, you know, their, their threats and their uh, crises that they would face. Um, the third country that comes into mind here is Israel. Uh, Israel was founded in 1948, uh, even sooner, but Israel came in as a country that pretty early on said, we're in a state of survival here. We need to make sure we have food. We need to make sure, more importantly, we have water. And we're going to commit ourselves as a nation to make sure that we can build resistance, build resilience, build uh, capacity, and more importantly, build dependability and predictability in these in critical systems so that we can go from a state of survival to a state of living and arguably eventually to a state where you're thriving. And with Israel, it's just amazing to understand how much focus their government, along with their people, understood what was at stake, and they could then put their efforts towards building uh, that kind of resilience, that kind of, a, a, of a, uh, a grasp of their destiny into everything that they were doing. And I, I would uh, take uh, some great uh, sense of uh, relief if we could understand as our country how lucky we are not to be forced into such uh, constraints that really push us at alarming speeds towards these kinds of solution sets, but also now that we're mature and looking at our, uh, our, our country that's uh, you know some 200 something, 50 years old or so approaching that, how we can start to recognize that uh, the clock's ticking, we have a lot of opportunity then to change even our own destiny uh, and make ourselves more resilient, more predictable in how we're gonna face the century that we're in today. And so moving on then, this idea of building resilience, um, and whether it's resilience in the face of a natural uh, catastrophe, natural pressures, or building resilience, resilience because there's so much man-made potential for crisis in our world today. Uh, part of that comes from this, you would call it uh, deferred 
thinking. Uh, everybody understands what deferred maintenance is, right? We, we, we suffer uh, all over, whether it's in our daily lives uh, from deferred thinking, I'm mean, sorry, deferred maintenance uh, might be within our automobile, our house, uh, inside of our own mouth as far as deferred maintenance of keeping your teeth in order and going to the dentist regularly. You know, you can imagine how quickly I, I say that only because uh, you, you, you recognize that sometimes by ignoring what's obvious, you, you, you get, go through painful experiences. Um, and going back to this idea, if you knew any better, uh, is that ignorance or is it negligence when you don't act? This challenge we're facing a, a, as we see it today might be typified by a handful of these collapsing bridges, whether it's in Pennsylvania or Minnesota, but, or, or more importantly, uh, the dam in Orville, which was built with basically 20th century, maybe arguably 19th century technologies. And, and the, the decision right now is you can see very clearly that the dam in Oroville uh, in California that was on the verge of catastrophic collapse, um, the design, everybody would say today, you wouldn't build that dam that way knowing what we know today. Uh, we're praying uh, and hoping that we can get through this uh, predictable snow melt that has to come in these next month and a half and get away from that danger and then get back in there and fix that, uh, that edifice there. Um, but it's a tip of the iceberg, if you will. There's a lot of old infrastructure that we have in our world, a lot of old infrastructure we have in our country, and, and we ignored it at our own peril. More importantly, we have a lot of great tools to redo things and change things. And I think uh, we're starting to hopefully get a little more on top of that, but we need some vision in that area. We need to be not complacent, but moving forward. And that includes then uh, our agricultural system. Uh, I've been never more uh, upset or, or, or just uh, on given days so saddened by the way uh, our country treats agriculture, how different groups attack agriculture, how so many folks look at agriculture as if we're some uh, entity, entity that has, is con, you know, conspiring to make things worse, whether it's with, your, with the environment, whether it's with uh, food safety, whether it's with uh, the amount of water we use, you know, that we want to waste water. Um, I, it's, 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 it shouldn't be shocking only because when you produce so much abundance, it allows everybody to have an indulgence in the, the indulgence, if you will, and the uh, indulgence in the abundance of luxury, that you, the luxury of abundance, if you will, that allows everybody to have their, their opinion on what kind of food should you have and what kind of food should you not eat or what kind of system should you be producing or, or, or all the different ways that uh, an indulgence, when you have so much abundance, it gives you choices. Having choices is really the goal here. We want the world to have choices, as many choices as they want. If they want biodynamic, great. If they want uh, conventional organic, if they want local grown, if they want whatever it is, if we can create abundance, that's the goal for a planet. The minute we don't have abundance in any category area, you start to move towards scarcity, and scarcity is how you start to create some conflicts and some other challenges, uh, whether you like them or not. Um, the Dust Bowl, uh, was a good example of a past situation. Everything was humming along and all of a sudden we had a natural catastrophe and guess what? We had a near collapse of our ag systems because of both economy and uh, natural phenomena. And that collapsing system kind of got everybody awakened up and lo and behold, what did we get out of that system and that scarcity and that challenge? We got a pretty good farm bill and a support for agriculture for the next uh, uh, 60 years or so. Um, arguably, and then all of a sudden we're, we've gone humming along uh, with tremendous abundance in the stores, tremendous of ch choices of what kind of fast food you want to eat today, what kind of fast food you don't want to eat, you know, what kind of, uh, you name it, and because of the great job we've done, it, it's created this, uh, this unfortunately, for, unfortunate, this kind of sense of privilege on the part of the consumers who think that food is a right. Uh, and I argue with my, uh, my friends, in fact, a lot of friends are upset with me because I go, food's not a right. Food is a privilege. If, you ha if I can't promise that I can get that food on the table, once it's on the table, once we pr pr produce enough, once we have the capacity and we're producing plenty of food for all the world, 
then you can say that it should be a right for everybody to have access to it, and I know we're going to work towards that. I'm going to talk about the sustainable development goals at the end of my speech, Pierre, but um, today is just we got to make sure we can get the food to be produced, and in that luxury of abundance sometimes this idea that food is a, a, a food is a right is, is taken indirectly as uh, as uh, as something that we must provide but then we're going to tell you how to do it and in california uh, i i never thought i'd see it come to this california is a tremendous agricultural uh, uh, state in terms of a production center. I think we had what a fifty billion dollar um, farm gate. We're somewhere around fifth or sixth largest agricultural uh, uh, state uh, or production area on the planet. Uh, you can do all the comparisons, but there's just a lot of production there, uh, a lot of different commodities, and we're blessed with all kinds of different climate ranges and different kinds of ways to produce food. Um, but in California currently, there seems to be almost a uh, grow food, go to jail sentiment. And I, I say that with all seriousness. It's amazing how the farming community is being attacked for things that have transpired over the course of uh, a century, things that have happened as we've been uh, told to farm a certain way, use these tools, use these uh, practices, use these uh, uh, new rules and laws over the course of time, and the public there, the legislators there, seem to act as if they have nothing to do with being complicit in the agricultural endeavor of, in other words, of eating food every day of participating in the agricultural abundance that we create, and, and they're acting like we can just isolate it. In fact, a lot of this discussion this, during this conference was talking about agriculture using water, and somebody said it very easily. Every piece of food we, uh, we produce, it's a mining event. It's got water in it, it's got minerals, it's mining stuff out of the land, it's used water to produce it, and it's part of the human endeavor. Uh, what's the alternative? Oh, it's hunting and gathering. Okay, well, <laughs> which choice are we going to have? It's, it's a good choice. We're going to produce abundance, and we're going to do it well, and we're going to get better and better and better with each year. And instead of thinking that we're conspiring to hurt the environment, conspiring to hurt citizens' health, conspiring to uh, hurt our own employees, uh, I think what we're hoping for is a new dialogue about that. I think there's time to kind of wake up. Uh, my good friend Pat O'Toole, who's a rancher on the Colorado-Wyoming border, he puts it out pretty simply. You have the hatefuls and you have the hopefuls currently uh, that are uh, dealing with agriculture in different ways. The hatefuls, they need to sell fear, they need to peddle, uh, kind of make agriculture an enemy. That's how they can get membership or that's how they can get funding. The hopefuls want us to succeed. Um, you know, there's an easy uh, vision statement for agriculture, uh, for civilization, for the world. You can say successful agriculture sustains civilization. Um, you know, what is successful agriculture then? Well, it's a lot of different things. And the goal right now is to be successful into the, into the future. And so when I say what a difference a year makes, let me say what a difference a century makes. Uh, I farm uh, in... Seal Beach, uh, I farm next to a dry, farm, dry bean farmer. His name is Roy Perchy. He's 92 years old. Uh, just this last month, he turned 92. And he shows up every day, drives his pickup, gets up on the tractor. He's just the most amazing guy. And I know Roy has weathered. He was the one that told me that we had a hurricane in 1939 because he was a 14-year-old boy. And it showed up. This is the last time there was a hurricane in Southern California, last time and it showed up without any warning because there was no radios or TVs, and there was no weather station to tell you that it was coming, but it was after a severe heat wave in September, September 21st, actually, in, in California. So every time these days there's a hurricane coming up, I suddenly realize that I need to panic a little bit because uh, it has happened, it will happen again. Roy is an amazing guy. Uh, he was, I know that he has horses, he, he used to drive horses uh, uh, for harvest. I mean, and for cultivation. And, and I was asking him the other day, we loved our coffee shop talks, and I said, hey Roy, um, do you remember the names uh, of your horses? And he goes, uh, oh yeah, there was Claude, and there was, uh, there was uh, uh, Claude, and, um, and uh, there was, a, what was the other big, big horses, and, and um, Holly, 
but there was a horse named Dolly. He goes, and Dolly was a small horse, and all the Japanese growers in the area used to come and borrow Dolly because she had small feet and wouldn't step on the plants. And I go, oh, that's precision agriculture. You know, that's, that's a, <laughs> and here's this, you know, here's this farmer telling me, my friend telling me that he actually grew up in the era with, before there were tractors. And so what a difference a century makes, what I'm trying to say is it's unbelievable how much uh, we're moving forward in that if you don't believe we're in the middle of a renaissance, if you don't understand that the, the, the pace of knowledge, the, the, the amount of, of new thinking that's taking place as we live and breathe, um, then, then you're, I don't know where, where, where you are because we are in an agricultural, a new age of, of agriculture. And it's a time for, if you will, a global reset button. Uh, we talk about North American climate smart agriculture. We talk about what does that mean? But it means not climate dumb agriculture. You know, <laughs> we're just trying to show that this is a new way of looking at uh, the world in agriculture with a different kind of toolbox than we had 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years ago, even 20 years ago. The toolbox is becoming more and more robust. It's becoming more and more dynamic in what you can do to adjust your destiny on where you're going to head next. You know, in an ag renaissance, you're going to see the words, the innovators, the accelerators, the adapters, the anticipators, the folks that understand that we've got a lot of challenges ahead of us. I won't talk any lengthy time about invasive species and in diseases. Uh, Norman Borlaug was that kind of an anticipator. He could see that we had tremendous threats ahead of us. and spend a lifetime focused on saying, I'm going to try and get ahead of some of those threats. We have a lot of challenges ahead of us. And yet we have so many new options and new ways of thinking. If we turn on that lens and take a look and, and have a different vision of where we want to go. Um, in, ag, in, in water, and because this conference was specifically on water um, as it relates to food, um, there are so many exciting new technologies that were just barely thought about or barely dreamed up uh, when I was a kid. So desalination is an easy one. It's accelerating. It's moving forward so fast. It's, it, it's, and whether it's at large scales or very small scales in your home, uh, all these different new ways to look at how we might take water and create a permaculture, if you will. I, I'm a big fan of the nexus between water, energy, and food. It, it just, they, they can't be spoken about in, in silos. They have to be looked at and, and designed, actually, with this idea that we're going to create resilience by incorporating a, a different new kind of thinking. It's not new. It's actually really old. I mean, the the oldest example of where did they put the mill it was next to a river because you had water power. Where was the, the city? It was next to a river because there was water. Where was the food? It was next to the easiest place to irrigate uh, and where, the, where your, your livestock could, could get water. Um, this is nothing new, but as we're looking at these elegant new ways of designing our own home, uh, a food system where a large part of our food system might be produced in our home, on top of a building, or any other place. You're not going to feed the world from the top of a building, and you're not going to feed the world from your backyard, but you can augment your food supply with aquaponics, hydroponics, aeroponics, uh, all these vertical systems. It used to be that you measured uh, agricultural production by the square foot. Now we're measuring it by the cubic foot. Uh, you can put these amazing uh, hydroponic systems in uh, where you basically one acre will produce produce the equivalent of 28 acres or 60 acres, depending how high the roof is. It's just unbelievable. And seasonality, there's no seasonality. You've taken out seasonality when you go into a closed environment system, and you might produce five crops, six crops uh, a year of something like lettuce, uh, because it produces it every 55 days, and you move it, and you put in another plug, and off you go for your next crop. No cultivation in between, no, 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 you know, uh, waiting period. You just keep on cranking out uh, some of these things. Um, when you look at a brine line or brackish water, there's great technologies that are almost uh, fully mature right now that are looking at taking the, the minerals out of the brine line or out of the bra brackish water and repurposing them so they can be used as the fertilizer base for that water in that area. Uh, that's taking place as we speak, and it's uh, whether it's in South Africa or, or a couple tests going down into Argentina, those are really great. Uh, I know that I had a, a, a atmospheric water harvester about the size of this, this uh, 
uh, pedestal here um, that produced about eight gallons of pure water a day, pulling it out of the atmosphere with a, with a carbon filter and an ultraviolet light that would clean up the water because there's, you know, there's particles in the air, there's bugs in the air. But eight gallons of pure water a day for any household, you could have one of these systems plugged into your wall. At the time, it was about 60 cents a gallon, uh, the cost of electricity. But when you drinking, uh, you know, the drinking bottles that you buy, it's kind of hard to believe. But the funny thing about that water, it's too pure. So now you have to add minerals because you can't put pure water, H2O, kind of messes you up, I guess is what I hear. So all these things are out there and they're just coming online as we speak. Some of these, uh, as, we, as we speak, some of these atmospheric water harvest machines are the size of, you know, multiple size of uh, ocean sea containers and they'll crank out 2,000 gallons of pure water a day and now it's dilution is the solution. You take that water and you blend it with whatever your uh, semi-salty water is and you can uh, bring your water down based uh, on a system that might be driven by uh, solar or by wind. And so the energy driving these things uh, is what's also collapsing the price of cleaning up water. Uh, whether it's water reuse for potable use, water reuse for non-potable use, that town that I live in, Irvine, was the first town on the planet to have dual plumbing, mandatory dual plumbing, so that you flushed your, water with re uh, flushed your toilet with reclaimed water and watered your lawns and stuff. And then the potable water, of course, went into the drinking fountain and the, the tap in your kitchen. But uh, that was some 30, uh, 20 something years ago that they started dual plumbing in our area. Uh, I also farm uh, in then in that same exact area, that watershed I described, the Santa Ana River watershed, the first hydrogen fuel cell driven sewer digester is in our town there where there's a, uh, this, they're taking human sewer, digesting it, pulling out the methane, splitting off the hydrogen, driving that into uh, hydrogen fuel cells that are cleaning up the water, driving the energy for the plant to do that. Uh, and it's amazing because just 20 years ago, talking about a hydrogen fuel cell car on the road was people were laughing. Governor Schwarzenegger said we were going to build a hydrogen highway. And I remember we were there because he was there and we were kind of giggling in the background because we were saying, God, there's, there's no known technology of how we're going to get a dollar's worth of hydrogen into a car. It didn't exist. Our Department of Agriculture got $4 million to create the first uh, dispensing system for hydrogen on the planet. And today you can buy a Toyota or a Honda, I think, a hydrogen fuel cell car. And guess what? There's a hydrogen highway. It's, it's an amazing. I, I got to drive a hydrogen fuel cell car for two years. Uh, and it just made you feel really good to see water dripping out of the, uh, out of the exhaust system there. But um, we're, we're looking at retooling our, our energy systems, whether it's mini hydro. Everywhere you have water with pressure, the mini hydros are able to tr create tremendous new kinds of energy access. Uh, solar's getting better, wind's getting better, uh, taking every kind of waste that we might have and turning it into an energy source or a, a, a soil amendment source uh, through pyrolysis or, or digestion. Uh, all these things that are maturing at a time with the digital age is then giving us a, a better reason to think that the solutions for where we're headed in our, our lifetime uh, are, are pretty exciting and pretty uh, monumental ways to rethink and replumb and re-engineer uh, uh, the average city. In fact, I, I'm not buying it that we're going to see, we have mega cities and we're going to have some mega cities all over the world, but that's not going to be the exodus. The exodus, I think, will be towards really vibrant cities like Lincoln. I just couldn't believe how great this, this town here is. There's some great revival here and uh, if you can create uh, permaculture kind of thinking. In other words, you're off-grid and you have energy and you have food and you have water and you are pretty much got that covered. People want to live in a lot of places where you have that well under control. That's the city of the future and I think that's where we're going to see some great opportunities all over the planet, whether it's in Africa uh, or, or in the United States. Um, you know, the tale of two continents that are just so far apart today, but everybody gets to retool at a different pace. It took us a long time to get here in the United States. It's not going to take Africa that long to come and jump into some really uh, dynamic kinds of living and, 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 and ideas. Uh, one last thing I want to cover, and I'm going to close up here because we're about down to the last 15 minutes, is, um, and, and don't, I'll probably get booed here, but uh, that's okay. Uh, this idea of moving 
a pipeline of oil from one country to another is not that different than the idea of moving water from the Mississippi at flood stage over to your aquifer over here, or for us to move it from the north down to the south. Moving water around, if that's what you want to do, is, is, is we shouldn't be thinking that, oh my God, we can't do that. Why, why, why not? We do a lot of interesting things. We put power lines all around the country. The other thing is, when we talk about there's no water and we're going to have this horrible situation with not enough fresh water and you kind of look at all that blue on the, on the, on the globe and it's seawater, of course, and you say, what, what, whose, whose world are we living in where you say we don't have enough water? If you Obviously, if you want to take water out of the ocean and clean it up and pipe it to anywhere inland, it could be done. It's not maybe the most cost effective. But one of the things that we can also do, instead of storing water behind a reservoir or anywhere else, you can store water inside of a bottle. Uh, you can store a body of water inside a body of water. You could store an amazing amount of water in the Salt Lake, for example, fresh water in some kind of a plastic. I don't know what the separation would be. It might be electronic that you could separate, keep fresh water away from, because fresh water is lighter than salt water. You can create great reservoirs out in the ocean and hold fresh water. At flood stage coming out of the Chesapeake Bay in the 1700s, you had ships two miles off the shore loading up barrels of water uh, that were drinkable because that's how much fresh water was pouring out of the Chesapeake Bay at flood stage. And so the ocean could be a great place to hold a lot of fresh water if we wanted to, but then that wouldn't, be make, that wouldn't make the dam making people very happy, right? Because then you'd have a different way to store water. Uh, all of these things create challenges for in existing industries. And when you uh, perceive yourself to be uh, in the buggy whip business, and there's a bunch of young kids here when I say buggy whips, they don't even understand what I'm saying about buggy whips, right? But the buggy whip industry means, you know, how quickly are you a, a dinosaur on a branch of evolution and you're not going to be able to stay in business much longer because you're obsolete. Um, many of us in agriculture are facing some aspect of that. And as we move forward right now, all of us have to be ready to adapt, ready to uh, adopt, ready to change what we're doing if we want to keep in business, if we want to keep on moving forward. And that goes with our food production systems and our livestock and everything else we're doing. We can't be afraid to change if we can see that if we don't change, we're going to be that proverbial guy on the track thinking we're making progress and yet we get run over. So let me finish by just talking about that last statement about success successful agriculture sustains civilization. It's just four simple words. We don't have to talk about what kind of agriculture it is. As long as it's successful, that's our focus right now. I, I hate getting into a fight about who's got the best kind of agriculture, or what, who, what certification should we have to make sure that this market exists. I understand the markets exist. I understand we'll grow for those markets. I understand that's the preference of, a, of the public. Uh, it's our job then to try and educate that public to get them more involved in this outcome that we call uh, the future. Um, uh, in the sustainable development goals that are out there, 13 years away, 20, the year 2030 is 13 years away, but if we can produce the excitement and enthusiasm globally to plug in everybody from wherever you are in your world, wherever you are as an individual, as a company, as a government, to say that, hey, that's a pretty good goal set. And we're going to try and accomplish those goals. And knowing that nine of the 17 at least have a lot to do with agriculture, it, it, it comes, becomes incumbent on us from agriculture to maybe lead the way and start to say, quit fighting, quit thinking that agriculture is a part of a problem when we're the only ones that have, hold the key to be a solution uh, for how we get to and actually arrive at those goals. Uh, and the day that we arrive at those goals, we have a different world. It's a world where whiskey will be for drinking and water will be for living. So with that, I'd just like to say again, thank you for inviting me to be here today. And more importantly, uh, uh, let's get, uh, roll up our sleeves and get to work. We've got a lot of work to do before the year 2030. Okay. So, no deferred thinking here. So, questions. We have microphones in the center aisle if you would prefer to stay in your seat. Jesse over here has a microphone. And for those of you online, if you uh, send your comments and questions, we can get them on the floor. Do you want to use a mic so that folks online can hear you? That's our 
Easy crowd. Thank you. I'm a little concerned uh, what you're saying about the consumer's thought in California about the attitudes toward agriculture and so forth. And what I, it's nothing new in a lot of ways for, for us to hear that. How, two questions. How widespread is that thinking, do you think, in California? And what bothers me is what happens in California eventually gets to the Midwest. You know, uh, uh, the best example I, I, I could imagine was the recent two changes recent where uh, the, our legislature couldn't understand that why is agriculture need to work six days or seven days out of the week when you have a especially highly perishable crop that you're harvesting. And so we had protection uh, as the rest of the as does the rest of the nation to be able to uh, take five, six days and work extra hours because sometimes you're trying to get ahead of a storm or you've got just uh, your, your crops going to rot if you don't get it off. And the idea that there's overtime we, we're we're clearly trying to work closer and understand that our, our employees have to be viable, have to have a, earn a good living. But we're, we're seeing that the, the state is actually moving to punish uh, the very act that we have of agriculture and why we would look for an exemption for a different kind of hourly rates than just a factory that turns its uh, operations on and off. That's one good example. The other more alarming example, that that revolves in the area of social justice, which I understand there's some enormous challenges. I wish our employees were paid more than the plumber, because they're a skilled, la a skilled labor that's so skilled, it's unbelievable how much uh, a skilled set of, uh, of hands can uh, take you through your, your strawberry field or, or your orchard or your pruning your vines. Uh, you know, the, our, the society doesn't quite understand that. We don't haven't found a way to uh, make that statement so that our employees uh, are some of the highest paid. Uh, in other words, it's a career of first choice uh, should be in agri working in agriculture anywhere. But we're, we have to try and make that argument more and more. And maybe now that we're less than 2% of the population that's including our, our employees, maybe we'll have some leverage there someday. But the other place where I think this, this grow food, go to jail thing is really uh, becoming alarming is, is uh, what happened recently when there were some nitrate issues in California in two different watershed areas where the aquifers in two uh, farming areas next to two small towns had impaired the drinking water by uh, s several parts per billion as far as too much nitrates in the water. And the state named actually different growers in each area, the state of California, the water board named us different growers and said, you guys are the cause of this, you're going to have to clean it up. And, and I, I, I wanted to make one observation in that when the U.S. military, in the name of national security, uh, has operated bases all over the planet, they've actually had horrible records on the environment and dumping things and, and, and dealing with their properties. They've learned better, but, and now they're doing much better jobs than ever before, but because they know better. But no one's ever gone to jail. No one's been put in, pointed a finger and said, well, you guys created a mess. You guys have to clean it up out of your own pockets. Uh, no, we as taxpayers are cleaning that up in super funds because it's part of the national security, and we're going to try and make sure that now, from now on, the military bases are run much better, and, and that's an important component of learning that's taken place in these last 20, 30, 40 years. For the American public then to turn their back on the, on the American farmer who's only been growing food for national food security and he's been taking instructions from universities, from the land grants, from the, from the U.S. government, uh, at USDA, from uh, EPA for the different labels that we have and, say, and we're, we're doing what we know how to do is farm uh, and produce food. To have then the U.S. who's much more complicit in food security than national security, I would argue, in these last 40 years or 50 years, 60 years since World War II, well, you, you have other wars, but you know, you know where I'm headed with this, is that everybody's complicit in a challenges. If we have nitrates, if we have residues, if we have is issues with the environment that's coming out of agriculture, help us solve them, but don't put it on the backs of the farmers. We're just trying to get the food supply out and done correctly and efficiently and affordably, and we will clean up if given help. But to put a farmer in jail or to threaten him for all these different things is where I'm, I'm just seeing it's a line that we got to draw and say that's ridiculous. Why would why would we? Why is there so little support coming out of the rest of 
the land grant system at a time when we need that help. We were only doing and using the tools that have been given us to get a good job done. And so that's where I think we've been deserted a little bit, and I'd love to see some support, and more importantly, some public sentiment aimed back at the folks that just can't quite grasp that. And, and, and we are going to move forward. That's our, our little group, Solutions from the Land, is all about that, is just get the bullseye off the back of the producers and move forward. And if government can't get it done, which in many cases they won't, then let's just do it ourselves. And one by one, watershed by watershed, let's make some solution sets that uh, help us move out of the past and into the future. I think that speaks uh, to our focus on science literacy in the Institute as well. I mean, it's a real issue that uh, we've recognized here locally. There's a question in the back. For some time, California has been at the forefront of research and development for the so-called cultured meat industry. And now we're reading in the Wall Street Journal that Famous Foods is rapidly completing in the East Bay a one million patty per day hamburger plant. What are your personal thoughts on the future for feed grain based economies? You know, I had a chance uh, to be at the Dutch Embassy in San Francisco. I was invited uh, and I wasn't sure why, but we were invited to come and sample one of those faux hamburgers and actually some faux milk. These are, these are hamburgers and milk that are uh, created completely out of uh, the chemistry department, but they match even down to the, the burnt taste or the barbecue taste or the grill taste, um, what a hamburger might, would, might be. And I'll, I'll be the first to say, well, in a blindfold test, it sound, tasted like a burger. Um, if it had, I didn't get the chance to drink the milk, I'm going to guess it would have tasted somewhat like the milk. Um, and so the answer to that question is how great it is that we'll have choices where people can choose what they want to eat. If they want to eat that kind of a burger, uh, have at it. If they want to have a grass-fed burger, have at it. If they want to have the convenience of a great-tasting burger, uh, that uh, is uh, what we get to have, uh, the privilege we have right now, we'll, have, we'll all have at it. Um, I, I do understand that just like hydroponic lettuce might make the average lettuce grower or hydroponic tomatoes, because 50% of the tomatoes grown in the, uh, vine ripe tomatoes grown in the United States right now or consumed in the United States are coming from hothouses. They're not grown on in the ground, regularly in the ground anymore. These transitions are taking place, but they take place at different rates and different speeds, and the amount of consumption that we, I think we're seeing uh, is, is eye-opening of what's possible. What some of the folks on the, uh, on the uh, animal production side don't quite grasp is all the other great products that come out of the animals that we are able to harvest. And so there's, it's, 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 it's not a one in ch exchange for the other, all the things that come out of uh, a carcass. Um, in fact, we were talking, if you don't mind, indulge me a, a second on the hierarchy of things, uh, and this might not answer your question, sir, but when we talk about the hierarchy of goods, uh, of what we as a society or we as a country think is important, the argument about water uh, going into a gallon of water into an almond or, a, uh, or the 30 gallons into a cup of coffee, uh, the, 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 the discussion was never also about, well, I wonder if we were to make a list, if you were on a deserted island and you got, uh, you got uh, food production, you've got uh, a golf course, you've got uh, uh, horses, and you have your pets, uh, and you have to eliminate three out of the four, uh, and that's all you get for the rest of you know, the next decade. Which one would you get rid of? Well, you can eat the horse, you can eat the dog, you don't need the golf course, so the golf course comes off the chart first probably. Um, this country has opted not to eat horses anymore. And so when you were talking about water use and how much water you, does a horse use as a pet or how much water does your pet use as, a, as an animal that you have to put the poop in the bag and you know, those of us live in, those, not, not like Bart who lives out in the middle of nowhere there. Uh, it's not middle of nowhere, but it's out, out, out in the country. <laughs> For the record, he lives in Rising City. It's not in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> 
he lives in the country. But my, my point is, you know, we, we, we talk about this hierarchy of needs. What things can we, if, we, if we're going to stop washing our car, take less showers, are we going to eliminate the size of our pets? Is one pet too big because, you know, a Great Dane eats a lot more than a little Chihuahua? Are we going to, where, where are we going to make this hierarchy, this choice, all these different choices for uh, reduction of water when we have a scarcity of water? So that goes back to if we have a scarcity of something, everybody wants to tell you what you should get rid of. If we have uh, an abundance of different things, people will still want to eat their animal protein. People are still going to want to eat their new protein that's concocted uh, for, for a replacement for some. Uh, for maybe religious reasons or maybe otherwise. Uh, and then we're going to also uh, navigate through genetically modified, genetically engineered, uh, the different technologies that are a part of, uh, of uh, gene editing. All of these things become wonderful new tools in our toolbox for the food supply that we get to have. And I say that we get to have. It's a privilege that we get to have this, these choices. And uh, anybody that's going to try and tell you that their choice is better than your choice, or your choice is wrong. In fact, we're going to outlaw it. That's where I think we have to protect ourselves against that kind of thinking. What we want to do is, again, create abundance and create choices. So. That's great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Very much. Don't go too far. <laughs>